leadership has become incredibly complicated. Workplaces are being disrupted in ways we never could have imagined. So what's the biggest challenge to leadership? I'm Michelle Johnston, management professor, executive coach, and leadership expert. And I believe the biggest challenge for today's leader is connection. Why? Because research shows that connection drives results. That's why I've written the book, The Seismic Shift in Leadership, and why we are putting together this podcast series. Through interviews with some of today's top business leaders, we are going to explore how leaders' ability to connect with themselves, their teams, and their organizations defines their ultimate success or failure. Now, on to today's episode. I'm excited to introduce our guest today, Tanya Tetlow. When we originally recorded this episode, Tanya was the president of Loyola University, and I happen to be a faculty member at Loyola University. And so I chose to interview her because I got to see firsthand what she was like as a leader, and she was incredible. And she led the university through the two and a half years of the pandemic, and she did it with such grace. After we recorded the episode, she then took on a new position. She is now the president of Fordham University. She was chosen as the first female and as the first layperson, and I'm really excited for her. I'm sad for us at Loyola, but I'm excited for Tanya. Welcome. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here with you. What's interesting is that Tanya and I, and Tanya's in my book, and Tanya and I have been friends for a decade. And so we met each other on a playground. That's right. She she was actually pregnant with Lucy, her daughter, who's nine. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what's beautiful, many, many beautiful things about New Orleans, one of them is that you can walk out on a playground with a glass of wine. And the community came together as we were raising our children. And so every Sunday, we had a picnic table, and we would come together and all talk about our weeks. It was a beautiful way to connect about child rearing, the ups and the downs. And at the time, Tanya was a law professor at Tulane, and she ran the Domestic Violence Center. And at the time, and I still am, was a college of business professor. And I vividly remember one of those Sundays when we were all gathered around the picnic table, I was trying to find guest speakers for my class because I teach leadership. And there were a bunch of successful male leaders on the playground, our friends, and they all said, oh, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come, I'll come guest speak. And then Tanya said, Michelle, I would love to guest speak. Your students need to see some diversity and a female as a leader. I said, oh my gosh, you are so right. I said, but Tanya, you teach, and lucky Tulane is literally a fence. It's just one fence that divides us. She goes, I can run over after class. And when she came over and spoke as a guest lecturer to my students, my leadership students, she was phenomenal. And that's when I realized that Tanya was not just my friend who I hung out with on the playground as we're raising our children, that she was a rock star. And I got to see it in action that day. I had no idea, Tanya, that one day you would become the president of Loyola. Neither did I. (laughs) So will you tell us about that journey? Sure. I mean, I'd been a lawyer. I'd gotten pulled into academia because I come from a family of academics, and I found that I was teaching and writing on the side for fun, which is not normal. Spent 10 years teaching and then got pulled into administrative work at Tulane, um, which I think happens when, you know, you pick academic leaders from the faculty, and faculty are not hired for their leadership skills. They're hired for very different, also important skills, but not common sense or problem solving or all of those things that you need. And so um, it felt somewhat inevitable because I could do those things. And I really loved it. You know, universities are these enormously complicated entities. I'm on a board of a bank and I find that so delightfully simple in a weird way compared to what we do every day. And 
just finding from being the uh, chief of staff to the president of Tulane, he asked me to do that. He's a law professor by training too. So I think he liked having other law professors around him and I could translate him to others. But is both how much I learned from him about the strategy and the finances and all of it, but also how much some of the skills in me that I wasn't particularly using enough that I really wanted to, how relevant they were to his job. So I still didn't think, oh, I'm going to do that. But when the Loyola presidency came open, I'm very rooted in New Orleans. So I have a randomness to my career path born of looking for opportunities within five square miles, right? Which makes your career a little bit strange sometimes. Everyone in my family is connected to Loyola in one form or fashion. And I grew up on this campus in so many ways. And I come from a family full of Jesuit priest. So I thought, well, I should apply because it will be a useful experience for me to just even wrap my mind around that possibility. And I thought it was entirely safe that they wouldn't actually choose me, but then <laughs> it got closer and closer and I realized, oh my goodness. So I remember seeing you on the playground and wondering, when should I tell Michelle that I might... Oh, Actually. I remember prepping together for the for the search committee interview, and I remember being very honest with you, and I kind of wish that I wasn't. I can't believe I was this honest. I remember saying, Tanya, this is the first time they're going to allow a lay person to be president. You think they're going to hire a woman? Yeah. <laughs> I said yeah. that. I said that. I hope that motivated you and didn't <laughs> demotivate you. I just remember thinking, wow. Loyola is really progressive. I was so relieved. It was a daunting adventure and one where I, you know, I don't think if I'd gone into the market somehow for presidencies through search firms, I would have thought that this is my moment to do that. It was because this chance came up that I didn't know if it'd be another 20 years before it came up again, but I was 47, which is pretty young for a president. And I didn't have the traditional stepping stone of being a provost or a dean. So when I say I was an unlikely choice, that's not being self-deprecating. Uh, it was a real leap of faith in the board in thinking that the skills that I brought, but also the sense of cultural knowledge, both of being local, which is rare um, for a university to have a local president, but more importantly, really understanding Jesuit identity and mission and culture in a deep-rooted way. Um, I think that's why That's they wanted me. huge. I had no idea you grew up. I didn't even know your father had been a Jesuit priest. Yes. 17 years before he left to have a family. Before he met your mother. Yes. That's they, amazing. They don't, they don't, they never would tell us much about that courtship. They would just giggle, but. <laughs> That's was, some, and then your right. uncle is a Jesuit priest. Yes. He's, and a, and a wonderfully renowned and beloved one who's 91 years old now. So you know more about the Jesuit values and Jesuit niche than, than I think anybody else in the search. And what's been interesting is how deeply rooted all of that training is in me because I got it from childhood, not from formal training. But I've also found as I read more and more about leadership, which is not something I did as a law professor, it wasn't relevant to what I did. Um, there are two things that have struck me. One is how much of the ways that uh, women are trained and socialized to be actually overlap with what good leadership looks like, right? But leadership literature is a far more masculine language for all those same things. And the second thing was how much of the Jesuit way of doing things, which goes back 500 years in this massive organization that has succeeded for longer than almost any entity in world history, how much that training also really lends itself to good leadership. And there's some great books making that comparison quite direct, but I found it very valuable. That's incredible. And, you know, you mentioned also just having grown up in New Orleans and, and understanding the city. And, and the topic of today is not just leadership and the importance of connection, but it's also about giving up perfection. Yeah. And I dedicated my book called The Seismic Shift in Leadership, How to Thrive in a New Era of Connection. I dedicated my book to the city of New Orleans where you don't have to be perfect because I really struggled trying to be perfect for a long time. And I remember when I came to this city to be an intern for a consulting firm in my 20s, after having moved around every two years of my life and trying to fit in, trying to fit in, trying to be whatever I thought perfect was, and I came to this city 
And it just allows you to be you no matter what that looks like, sounds like. I love this city. And, but it also has a lot of challenges. And so how do you think New Orleans prepped you for this leadership position? I was at a dinner once listening to New Orleans musicians, some of whom had come here from elsewhere. And I remember one of them, um, Anders Osborne, who came here from another country, saying that the thing about the city as when you come here as a musician is you get here and no one tries to make you conform or to be exactly like them. They want you to have your own voice. That's the one thing they'll insist on is that you play your way, but that you do it better and you get the discipline to keep sort of honing your craft and, and to be you, but to be the best version of you. And that's what I think the city does best is that we're not trying to tell you who to be. We want you to wear a costume, but you pick the costume for the many days a year that we costume. Um, and I think also the suffering we've been through, I mean, that is the hard part of just humanity and life is that you learn and grow because you go through hard times, right? As parents, we hate that because we know our children have to stumble but we don't want them to have to, but that's, that's how this works. And so the fact that New Orleans goes through constant challenges, I won't claim that we always learn the lessons we need to, right? And I worry that we have this um, urgency that comes from crisis, but that it fades. And I wrote a message after Hurricane Ida recently to our community, but how do we in the way that the day after the storm, we remember that we have food and some of our neighbors are hungry and we cook the food and we bring them to the neighbors. How do we remember that that's true every day and to do it more often? But I do think that New Orleans and people in all of this area are very good about rolling with the punches, about getting past the ways that you can complain and whine and be thinking about yourself to immediately pivot to thinking about others, which is how you get through, and to just kind of laugh at things that aren't funny. I mean, one of our neighbors on the playground was telling me her aunt down in Homa was like, oh, Anne, guess what? I found a chair and my roof. <laughs> She's nothing else of her house but a chair and the roof, but she was laughing and laughing about that and that you you take, you take play the long game and you you learn and grow. That is so funny you said that because when the day that I moved back after the two weeks we had to be evacuated without power from Hurricane Ida, I looked up and my neighbors have a second story and I guess their roof, there was a leak and so all their furniture was wet. And so I'm standing outside and I watch them as they throw their sofa over the balcony and it splats <laughs> on, the, on the lawn and I realized I'm going to be staring at this splatted sofa for a very long time. <laughs> yes. And and that's just one of so many examples where that's why I dedicated the book. You can't be perfect. And it's ta it really helped teach me. You cannot be perfect in this city. And you have to celebrate imperfections. Well, and God laughs at our plans, right? <laughs> and I think that to bring it to the point about work, to be perfect, Perfect is to often be overly risk adverse, is to spend so much of your life being cautious that you're both missing out on joyful opportunities and you're full of anxiety all the time, those obvious things. But you can also make really poor decisions if you are so worried about avoiding one error that you can land on the other. So it really matters to just admit that there is an awful lot of life that's beyond your control and that you try to make the best decisions you can with imperfect information, knowing that it's not a measure of whether you made the right call, how the luck turned out. So we were just doing post-hurricane planning after the fact. And one of the categories I wanted everyone to think about is what went well, but only because we got lucky. And if we, you know, had to do it over again, we might not want to make that same choice, right? So you you have to let go. And you are so right. Let's talk about, we were young professors around the same time. And I have a vivid memory of me trying to be perfect as a young professor. I thought I was way too young at 28, way too energetic, way too positive. I thought, I can't bring that to the classroom. That's not going to be successful. And I remember I was I was lecturing on nonverbal communication in a stadium style classroom, and my heel went flying across the room, 
And I remember thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm going to give up power. I can't be, I can't be imperfect. I can't laugh and admit that I now have one shoe. So I hopped over, never mentioned it. The class didn't know how to respond. I just pretended that it didn't happen. And I think back to that day, like the, the Michelle now would be like, okay, that's hysterical. That's really funny. Watch me hop over, grab my shoe. Oh, well, but I just felt like I couldn't even show any sort of imperfection or weakness back then. Did you have similar experiences? I did. I mean, teaching law students, they can sort of smell weakness, right? And you teach a subject for the first time in law school and you can't possibly know that whole area of law because no one does and it changes every day, right? So there's a way there, they will always ask you questions where you don't know the answer and you have to do the honest admission of that's a great question. Let me look into that and I'll get back to you. And I remember thinking as a student, it never bothered me when faculty did that, right? It just, it shows that they are honest with you and they have the confidence to say that. And also you start figuring out that nobody can know the answer to all of your questions. So you're sort of proud of yourself for coming up with a clever one. But um, I think it comes down to it's much easier to be authentic and show vulnerability when people believe in your competence, right? And that when you get to the point of feeling like you're not worried that they will think you're not competent, then it's very easy to be vulnerable because you're not actually feeling weak at those moments. You're realizing you're more human, you're more relatable, you know it's value added, it's not actually detracting from you. But especially when you're really young, it, you're not imagining the fact that the students may be worried or, you know, although they always saw us as old, even when <laughs> we were not that much older than they are. Right. So there's that. Um, so I, I think it's not in your head. And I do think that um, it, even starting this job at Loyola, the first order of business was to prove I knew what I was doing yes. before I started being vulnerable with folks here. And, and that was quick, but that it really, you know, me seeming vulnerable, if they're not sure I have any idea what I'm doing, that would just scare them. But once they believed in that, then it made me human and like somebody who understood their experience and cared about what they care about and all of those great things about it. It's almost like a three-step process. I love it. First, make sure that you're demonstrating your competence mm -hmm. so that you've established credibility, and then you can show vulnerability. Right. Mm -hmm. And then, then being vulnerable looks like self-confidence, not weakness. Exactly. And I right. think back in my early years as a female young professor, I guess I was too insecure to even, I, I would never have admitted a weakness you know, I just wasn't secure enough, I guess, in myself. Well, that, and there's plenty of evidence that I think for people when they're younger, and then there's evidence that it's, it's more true for women that you would not have been perceived as competent if you showed vulnerability. Now, the shoe thing aside, right, because they just would have laughed with you on that. But it's not in your head that you have to worry about being perceived as competent, but there's only so far you can go with trying to make that about perfection. Because as I tell my team all the time, I'm not fooled that you all aren't making mistakes. And the way I know that is every single one of us makes mistakes. There's no world around that, right? So I do think you get to a point too, where you know, as a, as a teacher or as a leader of others, that you have to model for them how you respond to those mistakes. And that if you can see that in the classroom, you know, one of the biggest predictors of retention is how students deal with failure. Do they pick themselves up, brush themselves off and think not, I don't belong here, not, oh, maybe I'm not smart at all. I was totally wrong about that. But boy, I need to maybe learn how to study a little differently for that test. And then they move forward. But for students who have had especially, you know, either family structures or the world telling them that they don't belong and whispering in their ear not you're the greatest thing since sliced bread like our parents taught us but other things they immediately doubt themselves in a way that makes them fail so that modeling for our students and modeling for the people who work for us here's how I handle it when I screw up is so much more powerful than anything else and I, I just think that's the ball game in many ways because the biggest battle I faced when I come take over this bureaucracy of, you know, 800 employees 
is how do I get at the elusive truth? How do I know what balls are dropping and what mistakes are being made or what's really not going well? Because no one wants to tell you. No. They really don't want to tell you. And so that is the ball game in so many ways is to get people to trust all the things I said from day one, right? It's, I will be never more proud of you than when you admit a mistake to me and we learn the lesson and then we will never make that mistake again. We'll make some different mistake the next time. I said that till I was blue in the face, but they don't really believe you until you visibly admit your own mistakes and then move forward, right? That's what it takes. So if you're modeling the opposite where you're sort of trying to pretend you never make mistakes, you're going to scare everyone away from being honest with you. And that's a real problem. You are so right. So I call it, and it's in the literature, it's the mask of perfection. And if you're wearing a mask of perfection, it creates disconnection. And I've seen so many leaders fail who inadvertently created cultures of fear, like you just referred to, because they were so hard on themselves. They were perfectionists. And then so they were so hard on their people. And rather than creating a cohesive team, that leader created competition. Rather than that team being innovative, that team avoided risk. It's just wild what you see when you have an old time, old school kind of corrosive leadership style. It, it just doesn't work. Yeah. I mean, you get lied to. Mm-hmm. You never know what's really going on. People... Don't learn from their mistakes. And that's part of what I've had to model is to admit my own mistake and then have them watch me learn the lesson, but then not just self-flagellate and go into a spiral of shame and guilt and all of that, right? You, You have to, once you've learned the lesson, you forgive yourself, you move on. And there are, um, I had a, one of my cabinet come to me one day and say, okay, my team screwed this up. It comes at real cost to Loyola, but we've looked at our systems and we figured out how we'll make sure that particular thing never happens again. And we're so sorry. And I told them, I've never trusted you more than this moment because you're being honest and honorable about it. And I believe you that the mistake won't happen again for that reason. And, you know, stuff happens. And that was it. Right. And, and the fact that he came to me and was willing to do that means that I forevermore don't worry about what he's not telling me. Where some of the other folks, I do worry about that. Absolutely. And, you know, only the positive news flows up, information flows up to the president, and your whispers a shout, everything you do is scrutinized. I mean, it's it's a tough place for you to be. And then you have all these different stakeholders at a university who have such different needs from faculty to students to parents to alum. And you've done an incredible job. I think one of your greatest strengths, which is why I profiled you in this book, is your ability to connect and to connect to multiple stakeholders. So how have you figured out how to do that? What is, I know that's, that's your secret sauce or one of your superpowers, but to our listeners, how would you recommend doing that? I think that it comes from telling stories and telling stories on yourself is really awkward. I do not love doing that, but, but kind of taking note of the ones where you learn something or stories about friends or, you know, other things where there's people hear stories in a way they don't hear. I always want to jump to the conclusion. I'm a lawyer. I like that, but it can't be just here is the lesson. It's got to be how you got there, how you learned it. And I think you show authenticity in that. And then I very much make sure that any communication from me is written by me is in my voice, sounds like me. So it's warm and makes you feel something. And if at all possible is funny. So I reward the reader with something. Um, I'm just writing a message I'll send out next week for Loyola Week about if St. Ignatius could come in a time machine 500 years, what would he think of us? And then I put, well, he at least would be impressed by our level of technology. (laughs) 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 <laughs> which we're in the process of upgrading at the moment. Um, but, uh, and so I think that really helps. I think it is so weirdly rare that leaders don't translate themselves into this safely bureaucratic way of communicating that sounds good, but says very little at great length. And so I think people are just so refreshed by something that sounds human 
um, that it just, ha- I'm, I'm amazed at how the simplest of things that I write or say get such a response, but it feels less about me than about how often people have been trained to dilute themselves to blandness that just doesn't connect with people. You are absolutely right. Most of the leaders I know have a communications team. And they write their messages and they're beautiful, but it doesn't sound like it comes from the leader's voice. And you're right. And that's what differentiates your messages. And it has one of the highest open rates. I mean, our students read your emails. Students don't read emails. They don't. They're over emails. Yes. Uh Emails are done. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm proud of that. And that's what feels so precious because it's such an efficient way to communicate that I don't want to lose it. So anytime anyone presents some bureaucratic speak email they want to put out in my name, is like, absolutely not. I don't ever want to punish people <laughs> for reading an email for me. I want them to look forward to it, that there will be some delightful little tidbit in it that makes it worth their while. But that is that takes a lot of effort to do because it means that I can't let other people write it. No. No, that's exactly right. And you do put a lot of time and thought into it. They're beautiful messages. And so you had, you had mentioned something earlier about characteristics that, that, that when you read a lot about leadership, because of course it's not taught in law school, or when you're in a PhD, or in, in me in a PhD program, right? Or, or of how to be an administrator, you know, how to lead in that way. It's very masculine. Yet here we are two females who are leaders and so many of the characteristics I think we have that we bring to the table are feminine. How have you reconciled that? How have you, tell me about that. Well, first, I, I think it's important to acknowledge that a lot of the ways that men and women end up on average different in our mindset and skill set, we'll never know how much of that is biology versus upbringing. Um, I tend to think it's more of the latter because frankly, the way you're socialized and trained literally does train the wiring of your brain. Um, But I remember seeing a national news report on a new brain study. This was 15 years ago that, you know, looked at brain mechanisms and tested using different skills, men and women, and found that men were better at imagining three-dimensional objects in space and turning them, which is why they're very good at getting sofas through doors. I'll give my husband that kudos. And women were better at communications. And the news story used B-roll of two little girls in a kindergarten classroom playing with each other instead of two CEOs negotiating some major deal. And it just made me laugh. So I don't know that there's anything innate, but I do know that the ways that we're brought up very much prioritize communication, diplomacy, empathy, putting ourselves in other people's shoes. And as such, that comes with some weaknesses, right? We can be too thin-skinned. We're maybe not trained to be as good at conflict. We may be risk-adverse and perfectionist, right? Getting back to that. But it does mean that on average, we tend to have the kind of skills that leaders very much need, which are all about communications and empathy and authenticity. And frankly, all of that's better for strategy too. I mean, the ability to multitask, to everything about strategy is to put on different positions for size. Everything about negotiation is about imagining the other party's point of view and stance. Those are very useful skills. But when we talk about them in little girls, we don't talk about them in the context of how they're going to be incredible leaders. We just say they're quite nice. Yeah. And I mean, there have been a lot of books written about that. Nice girls finish last. And, you know, we were kind of told, and and I'm sure that's a part of the reason why I stood up in the classroom in the beginning. And I was very strict and very serious because nice girls finish, finish last. But thankfully, and And uh, I learned, you're absolutely right, that so many of our superpowers have to do with showing kindness, finding commonality, showing care and compassion. And that's a lot of the the themes that emerged in my my interviews, in my book. So, So when I have a chapter on show care and compassion to the whole person, when I have a chapter on listening skills... That's not, I, of course, I, I as an executive coach believe in all of that, but that's from, that emerged from my interviews. 
I developed the theory of connection. That's the only way you're going to be successful as a leader is if you have that foundation of connection with yourself. Then you can successfully connect with your team. Then you can successfully connect with your organization. But then I had to go out and interview. You were one of the 18 to figure out, okay, what does that look like? What does that feel like? What does that sound like? And what emerged is a whole different way of leading than the old command and control directive style. Right. You know, what emerged were, were the skills that you were just referring to. Empathy, compassion, care, listening, servant leadership, creating a positive culture. And so I was thrilled. We just did an interview with um, Larry Kloss, the CEO of Max Home. And you just wouldn't think with his personality and the way that he communicates that his entire mission is about happiness and gratitude. Right. But that's the seismic shift that's happening. That's where we're headed. I've loved reading about Ignatius of Loyola, whom this university is named after, but he, 500 years ago, talked about all the same insights, which is frankly why that company, as it's called, has lasted so long, is that you have to have radical self-awareness or else you will trip over yourself again and again. You have to understand that people bring their gifts to the table and that their weaknesses are often the flip of their gifts. And so you stop harping on weaknesses and you start building on strengths and you realize that you yourself have strengths and weaknesses and your job is to find other people to fill those gaps, not to beat yourself up all the time about the fact that you can't have the strengths of an extrovert and an introvert simultaneously. It's just not possible, right? And to then really build people up to trust them and then to give them autonomy. And he sent them all over the world to found universities. And within 200 years, he had, they, the Jesuits had 700 universities in five continents. That's how amazing they were. That willingness to be entrepreneurial, to fail, to take risks, to try, to do their best and to forgive themselves when it didn't work really is what is effective. It's what works. I love how you termed it radical self-awareness. And that has to be intentional and it takes time, but you have to do it if you want to be your highest version of yourself, the best version of yourself. It takes courage is what it takes because we're all deep down scared to really admit what we're good at and what we're bad at. But frankly, it's just being willing to treat yourself with the same respect and love that you hopefully treat other people, right? That it's, it's okay to make mistakes and it is inevitable, but I mean, it all, it takes all of us so long to get there. And if we're lucky, we do get there at some point, right? But that just feels like the purpose of life to find a way to love yourself. And that way you can actually love other people properly. And you can't lead people if you don't, you can lead them without caring about them, but they'll sniff it out. And there's a very different way of leading from a pedestal where you try to be perfect and to have gravitas all the time and to never visibly make a mistake versus being with them. I mean, to use a stupid military metaphor, which is bad military um, strategy, but I think good leadership is that if you're in the front line, Braveheart style, running with everyone else with your troops, that feels so different to them than if you're in the back on a horse telling them, go ahead. And... I also think that if you purport to be perfect and you're disconnected in that way that you're not fully human, boy, can they turn on you quickly because if all they know of you is what they project, then that can turn real fast. If you do then stumble, they're not going to think of you as human and someone they're rooting for or someone to get back up again. They're going to think, well, maybe you were never who I thought you were. So it just makes sense in all sorts of ways, but it's also such a better way to live your life. I could not have summarized it better. Thank you so much, Tanya, for being on this episode. Thank you for joining us on The Seismic Shift. And before you go, can I ask one favor of you? Do you mind sharing today's episode with a leader you know? The power of this conversation is found in your using it and sharing it to create real connection in your life. Lastly, I'd like to thank Loyola University, New Orleans, and the Terra Firma audio team for helping bring this content to life.